Protection Officers from around the country with us this evening. Uh, my name is Mandy McManaman. I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager in AMCAP, which is the centralized application for medical school. I'll be the moderator this evening. Just to cover a couple of housekeeping notes, um, you should be able to hear us, so hopefully those who are not hearing but saw the screen change will be able to use the chat panel um, to get help with any technical problems. If you experience any technical problems during this session, please um, also use the chat panel for assistance. If you have questions for our speakers tonight or for the AAMC, um, please use the Q&A panel. Um, we will allow questions between each speaker. We'll take one question between each speaker, and then there should be plenty of time at the end to cover the remaining questions. Just as a reminder, we will email a link to the recording of this presentation after, about a week after uh, this session. It will be posted to the AAMC Student Hub. We'll email that link to you when it's available. Just to recap who we have with us uh, tonight, we have Dr. Lena Mehta from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. We have Dr. Ed Daniel from Morsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida. And we have Dr. Iris Gibbs from Stanford University School of Medicine. Again, I'm Mandy McManaman in AMCAS, and I have my colleague Katie Post who will be feeding your questions um, for me to share with the panelists throughout the presentation. So, again, use the Q&A panel um, when you have questions. So, without further ado, we will go ahead and get started, and I'll introduce Dr. Mehta. Dr. Lena Mehta is the Associate Dean for Admissions at the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine and has served in this role for nine years. A graduate of Northeastern Ohio Medical University's BSMD program, She's also an Associate Professor of Radiology at University Hospital's Case Medical Center, where she practices in her subspecialty of nuclear radiology. Dr. Mehta has held many administrative roles in the context of both of these positions, including having served as the Chairperson for Radiology Risk Management and Quality at University Hospitals of Cleveland, and serving for several years on an interim vice dean for medical education team at the School of Medicine. She is a strong believer in the power of mentorship and is the faculty mentor for the American Medical Women's Association chapter and radiology interest group at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Mita. Thanks, Mandy. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this call. I know that we've got some great tips for you in the context of interviewing successfully in medical school. So as you're going to hear tonight, and as you're probably well aware from having done your research, which I'm sure you've done, about interviewing for medical school, you will encounter multiple different types of interview on the interviews on the interview trail. They're going to range from one-on-one -on -one interviews, which we do at our school, and I'll expand on more in a moment to panel interviews, potentially a couple faculty members and one interviewee, a couple interviewees and one faculty member. You may see the MMI, which you're going to hear about later this evening, and you may see some hybrids of any of those permutations. Regardless of the type of interview that you see, though, there are some basic things that most medical schools are looking for. Most schools are looking uh, for such things as maturity, are you ready for the challenges of medicine and balancing life together? Resiliency, are you able to recover from difficult situations, which you will see in the practice of medicine? The ability to collaborate is something that we think is very important in our school, and I know other schools do as well. The concept of the team is a very important one in the practice of medicine. Medical errors frequently occur when the team breaks down. So the ability to collaborate and to work well together to be able to give and take constructive criticism is something that's very important. Strong interpersonal skills are also very important. The best and most effective physicians tend to be the best communicators, both in the written and the spoken word. So that's something that we're certainly looking for at our school. And then emotional intelligence, which is defined in broad ways by people, but refers to the ability to understand one's own emotions and other emotions and to act appropriately. 
is something that we're looking for as well. Now, as I mentioned at our school, Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, we conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews. We have faculty and student interviews for our interviewees. We have three programs at Case Western Reserve. We have our more traditional uh, four-year MD program called the University Program, which is pretty big. We have 173 students per class. We have a five-year program for physician investigators at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. And we have an MD-PhD program, an MSTP, that has about 12 to 13 students in that. For the university program, you get one faculty interview and one student interview. For the college program, two faculty and one student. And for our MSTP, one School of Medicine faculty interviewer, one student interviewer, and depending on your research interests, between six and eight interviews with research mentors and PIs. So you can see there's some variety of experience there. But regardless of the program for which you're interviewing, all of our interviewers are trained in similar ways. I think candidates frequently find it interesting to know that we actually do train our interviews and we have templates for how we like things to go. Our interviewers are trained to keep things fairly conversational and low-key. We're a pretty low-key um, school. Um, our interviewers are trained to really spend time getting to know the candidate as a person and letting the candidate get to know the interviewer and what the school is all about as well. We also use our interview time to clarify parts of the application, and we have two structured questions that our faculty members need to incorporate in, and those will vary from week to week. Our interviewers are trained to have an opening, to set the candidate at ease, to sort of set the groundwork for how things are going to go, and to start to engender some good conversation. The lion's share of the time is spent on information exchange. Our interviewers are trained to ask open-ended questions and to let the candidate speak the majority, i.e. 75% of the time at least. We also leave some time for closing and we leave some time for questions. A few words about how to prepare yourself for the interview day. So you've applied through AMCAS, you've got your secondaries, your letters are in, everything's complete, you're reviewed by the screening committee and you get invited for an interview. What do you do next? Well, do your homework about the school in the city. Treat a medical school interview as you would a high level job interview. If you were interviewing for an investment banking company or a Fortune 500 company, you would do your homework about that, that uh, company. You would evaluate their infrastructure. You would know their mission, their ethos, what their product is, what their expectations are, what their culture is. Similarly, you should research the school before you show up for the interview. Our curriculum is based on team-based learning, and every year I'm really surprised to hear an applicant who shows up and says, you have team-based learning, team -based learning here? We're also a research-intensive medical school, and we do have research built into all of our tracks. And when a candidate says, you have research built into your curriculum, <laughs> we wonder why they applied to us. So make sure you do your homework about the school even before you apply, and certainly before you show up for the interview. Take the time to know what the format of the interview is going to be. If you show up thinking it's a one-on-one -on -one interview, but it's actually an MMI, it's probably going to be an uncomfortable day for you. So take the time to know what your interview day is going to look like. Review your application, particularly if you're going to a school that has one-on-one -on -one or conversational interviews. Every year, and I do a lot of interviews for our school, every year somebody sits across the desk from me and can't remember what their research is, they can't remember an extracurricular activity in which they engage, they can't remember their essay. And of course, I'm sorry to tell you, my first thought is, boy, did they make that up? How do they not have that instilled in their short, in their long-term memory base? But the reality is, you get busy, you forget, um, so do review your application before you show up. Next, practice being interviewed, but don't rehearse your answers. Now, that is not actually contradictory. What I mean by that is don't memorize canned rehearse answers. They come across as disingenuous. They come across as um, rehearsed. And every now and then, a candidate will answer a question that they've clearly memorized, but which isn't really the one that I'm asking. So, so don't memorize your responses. But what I mean by practice is spend some time sitting with a mock interviewer your significant other, your roommate, a professor, a parent, a mentor, your pre-health advisor, practice being asked questions. And we're not, typically not in tune um, and with talking about ourselves in an open-ended fashion. So questions don't have to be even medically related. They could be something along the lines of, tell me your earliest memory. Um, what is it? Tell us about your favorite, ex tell me about your favorite extracurricular activity. What's your favorite movie and why? Just get used to answering questions. As you're doing these mock interviews, pay attention to a few things. Think about the handshake. Handshake is your first opportunity, of your first point of contact with your interviewer. Is it nice and firm? 
Is it wimpy? Is it cold? Is it so bone crushing that the, your interviewer is going to have to go to the ED when you're done? Have a nice, moderate handshake. Eye contact is also important. When you're engaging with patients, it's important to establish that communication, and eye contact is very important. Are you able to look appropriately at your interviewer when you're speaking and when they're speaking to you? Think about your body language. Are you somebody who sits slumped in your chair with your arms crossed? That's a posture that's typically associated with defensiveness or anger. Or do you sit up straight with an open posture where you're receptive to giving and, take, giving and taking the information? Do you have any nervous habits? Do you twirl your hair? Do you fiddle with your watch? Do you have any what I call verbal tics? Do you say like or you know or and whatnot after every sentence? Those will all distract from your communication style. Think about your speech cadence. I tend to be a very rapid speaker, and it's something I've been working on through the years. So think about how rapidly or how slowly you speak. Look for cues from your interviewer. Are they leaning forward intently and looking at you and clearly wanting you to go on? Or are they leaning back in their chair and flipping through papers, indicating to you that it's time to wrap it up and let the next, to next topic come on? My big advice to you is turn your phone off. Don't be that person whose phone rings in the middle of the interview. Don't be that person, please, who's surreptitiously texting as they hold their phone under the table during the Director of Admissions Information Session. We can tell. Please don't do that. If, you're, if there's an emergency or expecting an important call, let people know. We understand. We're humans, too. But for the most part, please turn your phone off. Be present and be engaged for your interview day. So what do you wear on your interview? I know that um, some of my colleagues are going to talk about this as well, but we each have our own perspective. We're a pretty laid back school. We have high academic expectations of our students, but we're pretty laid back people and we think it's okay to add a personal spark. If you had a, have a funky tie or you want to wear some cool socks or you want to wear a brightly colored blouse, go for it. But do err on the conservative side. You never know who you're going to meet and not all schools feel the way we do. Make sure your suit fits. Do please try it on before your interview day. When I talk to people about uh, practicing interviews, I say put your suit on, get in the mood, get in the mode, get in your game, get on your game face. Put your suit on when you do some of your mock interviews, that way you make sure it fits and you know how it feels. Every year we do have a couple of candidates who lose their luggage and they show up at their interview day in their jeans and sweatshirt that they traveled in. We're okay with that. We know that life happens, but the candidate feels badly and it may get them off on a, raw, a bad foot where they feel a little bit um, below the top of their game. So think about if you're flying, if you want to carry your suit on the plane with you to avoid that potential situation. Wear comfortable shoes. Um, most schools will give you a tour, and if it's a large institution as ours is, you're going to be walking. So wear some comfortable shoes. Our school is located in a place that has seasons. We have summer, fall, winter, and spring, so make sure you check the weather. Um, make sure that you're dressed warmly for winter days and that you're not dressed too warmly for summer days. So do check the weather report before you show up. And one thing that I'd like to throw in that sometimes candidates don't think about is go easy on the fragrances. You're presenting a very professional demeanor and you don't want to smell like you're showing up for a first date and not to mention you don't want to hurt anybody that may have some fragrance sensitivities. And that's something to think about too as you move forward in your clinical rotations. Our employee handbook at the hospital prohibits strong fragrances. So think about that as you move forward. On the day of the interview, know where you're going. Know what time you need to be there. Every year we have a couple people who call five minutes after they're supposed to be there and say, now what time am I supposed to be there? Now where are you located? We get it. We understand life happens, but you're going to be stressed if you're that person. So know where you're going. If you have time, go do a trial run, show up where you need to be, and double check the paperwork or the email or whatever it is you get that tells you when you need to be there. Bring with you a list of questions. Think about when you go to see your physician. I know I'm a physician, but when I go see my doctor, I forget what I wanted to ask, so I write my questions down. Write your questions down, bring them with you. If you have any updates to your application, this is a good time to share them. I recommend bringing a snack with you. I have to tell you, I am one of those people that can get pretty hangry if I go too long without a meal. We give you breakfast, we give you lunch, but sometimes that's too long. So bring a little snack with you to make sure that you keep your energy levels up. If you're prone to headaches or have any medications that you need to bring with you, be sure to do so. And above all, bring with you a good attitude. By the time you get to the interview, for the most part, you've been deemed an academic good fit for that institution. So from there on out, you're interviewing us as much as we're interviewing you. You have that good attitude. You made it. You got right. You got to the point of the interview. So, so look forward to it and try and enjoy it as much as you can. This is your time to shine 
and to really share with us all the hard work that you've put forward through the, um, and through the previous years. Now remember, the interview begins not the day you, not at eight o'clock when you show up in my office, but the interview begins with the first point of contact, and it continues until you're accepted. If you call our front desk secretary, we actually have a human who picks up the phone, and you're rude to her, we're going to know about it. If you send us an email or a written communication that's unprofessional, we're going to notice. The interview begins with the first point of contact and continues. So be nice. Be professional. Uh, be the way that you were probably raised to be. Um, be polite and kind to everybody whom you meet. So I'm going to close here with my last slide. This is my most valuable pearl of wisdom for you if you come to interview at our school. Always, always laugh at the dean's jokes. Thanks so much uh, for your attention and enjoy your interview process. I'm going to pass it back to That's great. Um, we're going to go ahead and we have one question. How much should a student save for flights, hotels, clothes, and other things necessary for interviews? That is an excellent and question. So hop in on that as well. Okay, I'll answer that. That's a great question, and I have that in my usual applying to medical school slide. It can be really expensive, and that is money you cannot put on a financial aid package. It's either going on your credit card or your, your, the goodness of your parents or somebody else are going to help you through that. We did a little calculation with medical students in our office, and we anticipated that if you have 10 interviews, you fly to half, you drive to half, you buy your suit, um, you're looking at probably $1,500 to $2,000, so it, it can be very expensive. So, uh, you know, it's going to vary depending on where you're flying in the country, of course, but it, it's pretty pricey, so it's definitely something you need to prepare for. This is Ed Daniel with USF, Mosani College of Medicine. I, I agree with Dr. Mehta completely with the travel. We try to help um, students who are interviewing by offering um, some of our current students, um, offer the host, the applicant, the day before uh, their interview to try to alleviate the hotel costs, just cut down a little bit. So um, um, exactly what Dr. Meta said, but just that sometimes if you know somebody in the area you can stay with, um, you can try to save yourself some additional money with the hotel cost. And that's a great point. A lot of schools do have hosting programs, ours included. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce Dr. Daniel next. Edwin Daniel, Ph.D., is the Director of MD Admissions at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Daniel received his B.A. from Chicago State University and his M.E.D. and his Ph.D. from the University of South Florida. As a USF alumnus, Dr. Daniel brings over 15 years of experience in admissions, student affairs, and higher education. In 2011, Dr. Daniel received the Mentor of the Year Award from the Office of Diversity Initiatives at the University of Central Florida. He enjoys working with students, peers, and building relationships with external constituents that help achieve his overall goals. So with that, I will go ahead and pass it to Dr. Daniel for um, his words of wisdom for you all. So enjoy. Good evening, um, everyone. Thank you so much, Mandy, for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited to speak with you this evening and talk to you a little bit about your interview day and um, how to survive um, that, that stressful day that we know is high stakes for you, and we try our best to make it really comfortable so that you can really put your best foot forward. A lot of my slides are going to be a uh, repeat of what you heard from Dr. Mehta, some differences because we do have a hybrid interview style with us because of our differences differences in our medical school. But I'll try my best to um, give you all the information you need so that when you're interviewing, you can be very successful and, um, and we can see that in our, in our applicants. I always start with this slide that we show to many of our applicants on their interview day, and I'll read it with you. Um, by improving the learning journey of our students, we will improve the medical journey of our, for our patients. And what we mean by that is many students love to come on their interview day and just talk about all the great things they've done and how smart they are and their accolades. And um, we kind of know that about you from the application. 
What we really want to talk about is how you're going to take that information and help students or help patients in the future, or how do you see yourself helping people in the future? And if you can somehow try to navigate the conversation on your interview day towards showing us your humanism and the type of position you see yourself, I think that goes a long way in your interview was really leaving your interview feeling confident about you and the type of physician you want to be and whether or not this is the place for you to be for the next four years and be successful. And so with that, um, I'm going to give you some points that I think are very critical that you should understand when you are looking at uh, your interview day and how to survive. I'm going to talk about seven points, and I'll just go from 12 o'clock around. I'm going to talk about the need for you to do your research, um, arrive early, um, dress um, professional, um, professionalism, the actual interview day and the actual interview with the interviewer, um, the importance of asking questions and the thank you letter. When we talk about doing your research, this is kind of a little bit of both between doing your research for the interview and doing your research uh, before you even apply. Like Dr. Mehta said earlier, it's good to know that when you come to your interview that you know a lot about the school and um, that you did your research, it shows the interviewers and the admissions team that you're really serious about the school that you are applying to. You should look at the website. A lot of information is out there about the medical school. We, many schools put so much time and energy and resources behind making sure the website is comprehensive. It's a shame that not many students actually visit the website before they actually apply. Um, USF, we do have two programs. A lot of people don't know that. We have a core program and we have a select program. The core program is four years at USF. Uh, we have tremendous teaching hospitals in the Tampa Bay area, um, tremendous faculty who are committed to educating our students. We have great research opportunities through our scholarly concentration. You can um, uh, get involved in um, electives with your medical curriculum, such as law and medicine, public health, um, medical humanity, biomedical research, health disparities. We have so many different electives that we can provide you to supplement your your path to becoming a physician, and many students really love that about our medical school. Uh, we also have the SELECT program, which is a two plus two program with the Lehigh Valley Health Network in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where students would do their first two years of medical school at USF Tampa, pass step one, and then literally move to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and complete year three, four at the uh, Lehigh Valley Health Network. It's a tremendous opportunity for students to, who, are, who have tremendous passion in leadership, and emotional intelligence, something Dr. Meta mentioned earlier. Um, I'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about the interview for both programs because they are a little bit different. With the core program, we have a traditional one-on-one -on -one interview style in which you will have uh, a faculty member across the table from you. The faculty member will have access to your complete file, your essay, your recommendation letters, uh, your academic profile, and questions can range from what's on the application to basically why do you want to be a physician. With the select program, the interviewer will be two faculty members who are interviewing you. They will not have access to your file. Uh, they will ask you three standard questions, and they are going to assess your emotional intelligence and uh, whether or not the select program is ideal for you. And that's pretty new for a lot of students uh, who go through the, a select interview because um, the, the ind individuals interviewing you are not going to be um, bias towards your academic profile or what you put on your, on your application because they didn't review it. And so it's really unique. It's a great program. It's very competitive. And that's something you should know about our medical school before you come on your interview day, especially if you're coming for a select interview, to be prepared for that type of interview style, which is um, um, not, not usual for those who are applying to medical school. As Dr. Meta said earlier, it is important to arrive early. A lot of times I tell students, if you come the night before, we have a meet and greet with our current students. You will have an opportunity to meet with them at Jason's Deli or Panera and just ask them any and all questions you have. The students will be there on your interview day also to, um, to provide you more information if need be. But uh, the night before is a great opportunity for you to get to know all about your interview day and exactly what you need to do to be prepared. Sometimes the students will let you come on campus. They'll take you to campus. They'll walk you around the medical school. They'll tell you where you should park. They'll tell you where your interview room is going to be, where you're meeting in the morning. So you can really get a leg up on what to do the, the next morning. In the event there's traffic, like Dr. Meadows said, there's bad weather. It really helps you save those valuable, those precious seconds that make sure that you are on time and not late. Many of the um, 
interviewers and the admissions folks get very uh, stressed out when we see applicants come late to their interview. It, is, it really doesn't send uh, a positive message for you. I would really urge you to take all precautions to not be late. And it says on the slide, ask Salge. Salge is the, the, on the student admissions leadership group that you will meet the night before and the day of, and they are very helpful in making sure your interview day is smooth. Dress professionally. I have seen some very creative things on the interview day. As my colleague said earlier, if you have a funky tie, you can wear that. I would advise you, in a sense, not to do that. Um, although some people may enjoy the tie, somebody may not like it. And um, I, don't I wouldn't advise you to take the risk on your interview day. A lot of times we've seen applicants try to make a fashion statement. And I've always said, err on the side of conservatism, as Dr. Mehta said. Um, um, it's, very, it's very important that you understand. You don't know who's interviewing you. You don't know their beliefs. You don't know their, their basis for making a decision. And you would hate because you wore a very bright colored suit that it just sent the wrong message to the interviewer. I just say, why take the risk? So just make sure you wear a business suit, clean, professional. Uh, make sure your hair is looking nice, um, conservative colors. And oh, it always helps to have something about the school. Um, it's not a make it or break it type situation, but it does add a little bit of of, 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 of element to the uh, interview that says, wow, you took the time to get a pen or a tie from USF. It just really kind of, you know, shows us that you really love the school and you're getting involved in the school spirit. So um, that, that that's a nice touch to add. Professionalism is very big, as you can see from the pictures I chose to put on here. You wouldn't believe how many times I've seen interviewers literally fall asleep or nod off during the morning presentation. And as much as you have come to tell us who you are and talk about your candidacy for our medical school, we're using this opportunity to tell you what we're about so that you leave here knowing all about the medical school and why we feel we're a good fit for you. It is a little bit um, 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 disingenuous and um, concerning when you show up and you're nodding off or you're texting or you may have realized that somebody in the interview room is a friend of yours from your school and you, you choose that time to engage in conversation while somebody's presenting on our curriculum or our diversity, it really doesn't send a good message to you. Um, sometimes we actually try not to interview people from the same school on the same day because of that, but sometimes we can't help it and it happens and it choose that time to engage in conversation. So be professional, be personable, but don't be a comedian. Don't try to make people laugh. Don't think that's gonna get you in. Um, be alert and attentive and very respectful to each other meaning the, um, your fellow interviewees and the uh, admissions team. And as Dr. Meta said earlier, the person at the desk, if you disrespect her or him, they may come back to bite you, and there's no need for that. Choose to be very professional during your interview. The actual interview itself, I cannot tell you the importance of speaking confidently. Really believe in yourself. You wouldn't have been chosen for an interview if we didn't think you were already a good applicant. Come on in and believe in yourself and show us how great you are. And I think that will go a long way in you getting a positive decision. Um, quick answers, I would say don't do that. Many times an interviewer may ask you a question and you say yes. And that's just not long enough. And you can't go too long either. You can't start with, I wanted to be a doctor. It was 15 years ago. I remember I was in the pool and um, I remember having a vision. And the vision, you know, now you're getting too long-winded and the interviewer may begin to get a little bit frustrated by your answers. So be very careful not to be too quick or too long. Uh, I always say as a good tip, answer the question, then elaborate. Answer the question and then elaborate. Do not elaborate first and then answer the question. You might forget what the question was. Um, when you are done, always ask questions. It's good to have some questions in, in your mind coming into the interview day that you feel you want to know about the school or with your interviewer before you leave the interview, please do not ask, how did I do? The interviewer is not going to say that you, you did a great job you're in, and the interviewer is not going to say you did a horrible job. I don't know why you came here today. Those, they're not going to say that to you. They're just going to say thank you for your responses, and um, you know, hopefully everything goes well, but they're not going to give you any feedback uh, on the spot. Also, do not interview the interviewer. Please, do not start asking them, why did you go to medical school? What would you change about, about, the, the, about the health field? Uh, how do you feel if you were in my seat? How would you have answered these questions? Try very hard not to interview the interviewer. It can come across negative sometimes. And finally, of course, the thank you letter. Many of you 
always decide to send a thank you letter, which is very nice and very polite and very good. But try very hard not to re-interview in your thank you letter. Please do not reiterate, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention when I interviewed that, and now you're answering a question. Please do not do that. Do not provide any additional information unless we ask for you to do so. That's very important. And do not be offended if your interviewers do not reply to your thank you email or your letter. Sometimes they, uh, faculty chooses not to do that because we just want to make sure we're not giving you any type of inclination that you did well or you didn't. So sometimes they just choose not to reply. So don't perceive that as a, um, a negative. And so um, I leave you with that. Uh, uh, we really hope that you can picture yourself here at USF, and I'm so looking forward to seeing some of you at our interview day, and um, good luck with the entire process. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. I'm going to toss another question out uh, for our presenters. Um, all of you online, you're doing great with the questions. We have so many to go through, so I'm glad we'll have time at the end. Keep those questions coming through the Q&A box. Um, all right, the question this time is, is it important to relate everything I do to medicine? I would, I would say no. As a matter of fact, don't relate everything you do to medicine. A, a lot of times we just want you to be yourself and just relax and just answer the question. And sometimes experiences outside of medicine drew you to medicine. I would always urge your responses to be genuine. Don't make anything up. Don't lie. Always speak from the truth. I always speak from the heart and just let the day happen. Don't try to force it down, down a particular road, like I have to make sure everything ties to medicine. So just be yourself, be confident in your responses, and just let things happen. I agree with Dr. Daniel. This is Dr. Maida. We like hearing about people who have lives outside of medicine. I have a life outside of medicine, and I think it's important to be able to balance both. We don't want a class full of pre-med bots who all think the same way and do the same way. We want to admit a class of unique individuals. And so feel free to talk about your life. And yes, you do not need to relate everything to medicine. Okay. I am going to go ahead and move on to our last speaker for this evening, Dr. Gibbs. Dr. Iris Gibbs is the Associate Dean of MD Admissions at Stanford Medicine and an Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology. Dr. Gibbs earned her MD degree at Stanford School of Medicine and also completed her Radiation Oncology Residency Training, also at Stanford. Dr. Gibbs is a Fellow of the American Board of Radiology and also a Board Certified Radiation Oncologist. She's published more than 100 peer-reviewed articles in her areas of expertise of pediatric and adult brain tumors and radiosurgery. Dr. Gibbs is a dedicated educator who has served as former Director of Education and Residency Program Director in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Stanford. As Associate Dean of Admissions, Dr. Gibbs is committed to recruiting a diverse student body to fulfill Stanford's mission to be a premier research-intensive medical school that improves health through leadership, diversity, collaboration, and innovation in patient care, education, and research. So without further ado, Dr. Gibbs, please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Mandy. Um, and thank you all for, um, for coming today. Um, it's a wonderful pleasure to welcome all of you as you embark on your journey to medical school. Um, so a lot of information has already been shared. Um, I may reiterate some points just to highlight a few things, um, but my focus today would be, will be um, focusing on the multiple mini-interview, which is a interview process that we adopted here at Stanford several years ago. So you've heard a, a bit about um, the types of interviews, um, and I'll also share some, some tips. The only word I'll say about the types of interviews um, I saw a couple of questions come through about um, the amount of time um, that is devoted, and that, that varies from school to school. Um, and typically on a traditional interview, it can be um, an interview uh, of a single or series of individual meetings with staff, administrators, faculty, and or students, or even a panel that can last anywhere between about 15 minutes to about 60 minutes each. 
um, and also that the um, traditional interviews can also be um, structured or unstructured. They can be blind or open. Um, and so those are things to keep in mind about, um, about the, uh, those interviews. But my focus today will be um, eventually on the multiple mini interview. So just in terms of a few basic tips. So um, the other panelists already have um, emphasized um, the uh, being punctual, being appropriately dressed, clean and friendly. Um, there can sometimes be challenges um, to these basics, especially if you find that your, um, your luggage is lost. Um, but if you're traveling, I can't emphasize this enough um, to uh, really bring your clothing and toiletries with you um, on the plane if you can. The other point that all of the panel panelists have made um, is to be is is to do your um, homework and to be prepared. Um, and this is um, uh, definitely a point of of emphasis. Um, I think that your interview should not be all cookie cutter. If you are interviewing at a range of different institutions, you should um, know exactly what type of interview that you are about to embark on. But also, it's very important to understand the vision and the mission of that particular institution. As, been, uh, as has been highlighted already, um, it's important that you somehow um, align um, your own um, uh, feelings of uh, and passions uh, with um, the mission, not in a disingenuous way, but to be able to um, uh, align that in a way where you know what kind of institution you're walking into. Um, and it's also important to know your own portfolio. Um, folks will come in having um, documented a, a particular interest or even a particular skill. I've heard of uh, one of our admissions officers mentioned that um, someone had mentioned that they were fluent in Japanese. So they were paired with a Japanese-speaking um, uh, interviewer. And lo and behold, that person de determined that that person really wasn't. So you want to be very careful about um, knowing what you've um, documented. And um, since our institution is very, very research-intensive, um, it is important that you're able to coherently discuss the basics of the methodology and the results of any research that you list in your application. All of that is going to be fair game. It's important uh, not to practice your responses in a way that um, you appear to be rehearsed. Because um, if you appear to be rehearsed, you can be judged as being disingenuous or insincere. And also, as you're asking some of those questions that Ed had mentioned, be sure not to have your questions so pre-rehearsed that um, someone that your interviewer would have already either answered it as part of some of the dialogue and you asked the question yet, yet again uh, because, that, because you weren't uh, necessarily listening. Um, I can't emphasize enough to be honest, and we haven't talked a lot about this so far, but um, we all know that um, in life, there are ups and downs, and there may be past problems, past mistakes, uh, past grades or issues, um, and you need to come reasonably prepared to address those issues. There's a delicate balance between um, of, of accountability between brushing a particular issue off and dwelling on, on your mishap too much. Um, learn how to strike that delicate balance where it is very clear that you have learned to take some reasonable accountability. Also in this area of being honest, I think it's important uh, because uh, uh, just as Dr. Maida had mentioned, once you get to the place where we're interviewing you, then we, you've, you've met those criteria for general academic readiness, and most of us would, would absolutely love to see you as part of our class. And so if there are struggles that come along, whether they be financial or otherwise, that preclude you from actually making it to the interview, we want to hear about that sooner or later. Occasionally there can be resources um, that are um, devoted to trying to get you to that interview. Because I know for me, I start with several thousand applications, and if, if uh, the, the several hundred that I invite for interview 
Um, if they aren't honest with me with regard to those things, they may um, not benefit from some of the resources that we have because we really, really would love to have that person come and give us face-to-face -face time. So think about that as you're going through your interview. Be respectful. Everyone has, interest, um, has emphasized this um, all the way from your cab driver to the receptionist to other students. Um, you really do not want to come off as being overly competitive with other, um, other individuals um, and just know that there's really no downtime during the interview. And of course, as Ed mentioned, ask questions, ask appropriate questions. So let me get into uh, the reasons why we have deviated a bit from the traditional interview. The traditional interview is the mainstay of most, um, uh, most institutions. However, the knowledge of grades and MCAT scores can, you know, they can actually drive the entire interview and that um, may not um, count into everyone's failure. And so knowledge of this type of performance has, has contributed twice um, as much um, to variance um, as if the interviewer was blinded. And in terms of reliability and validity, interviewer um, ratings reflect um, interviewer characteristics and can sometimes create a, a, rater, um, a significant rater effect. There can be poor inter-rater reliability um, in which uh, the raters, even in a panel setting, agree mainly on the top and the bottom few, but the folks who fit somewhere in the middle is a high degree of um, variation in scores. And even in the panel setting, there can be this high-risk global assessment errors where by if there's a particularly strong or boisterous individual, they could potentially lead the um, panel in one direction or the other. Um, and so for all of these reasons, um, I think the traditional interviews um, tend to have um, some limitations, particularly if it's only a single one. Um, if one has a number of different encounters, that can minimize some of the um, negative effects of the uh, traditional interview. And so what we've adopted in other institutions is a multi multiple assessment type of interview, uh, whereby if you're looking for something that's scalable like uh, communication skills, multiple raters analyzing multiple um, uh, scenarios are better than a single rater in evaluating a single um, scenario. And uh, early data have suggested that, these, that the reliability um, is quite good at about 0.7. Um, and uh, one of the things that we really want to uh, ultimately predict is really how students will perform as a physician. And so um, uh, there are some data to suggest that these multiple assessment interviews can help predict clinical um, performance, which is what we ultimately want you to be as a, as a, as a, um, a physician. And so the benefits of this multiple um, assessment interviews is that the multiple raters minimize the impact in, of individual bias. The structured scenario allows for there to be an enhancement of reliability, validity, and even fairness. And because um, it is not knowledge-based, like the MCAT for example, it allows for the rater to gain insight into non-cognitive aspects of your beliefs, your character, and um, judgments. Uh, and fairness can be improved by the quantitative nature of multiple independent ratings that are scored separately. And this is fully customizable so that each individual institution um, can focus on the, spe the school-specific skill set um, they would like to see in their interviewees. So let's move on to talking a little bit more about the MMI process. So the MMI is a, it was developed at uh, McMaster in Canada and is an interview format that it assesses your attributes uh, that are be, uh, important to becoming a competent and caring physician. So it measures things like um, communication skills that can't be really measured by your standardized examinations um, or by reviewing your application um, um, per se. Typically, the MMI uh, consists of about six to 12 short interviews, usually anywhere between six to 10 uh, minutes each. Um, those that are gonna be towards the 10 minute each would have shorter number of stations. Um, so that the entire circuit can be done certainly within a two-hour time frame. Um, and you revolve, um, these individual stations revolve around a particular um, scenario. 
Applicants have about two minutes to review the initial, the initial STEM before entering the room where they will find either an actor or a, a um, actual um, reader who's been trained by that institution to evaluate the applicant's response, but not necessarily to engage them in an active um, dialogue. Um, and then the raters then score the applicants at the end. And so it would look something like this, where um, an applicant starts at one station and then um, rotates um, after each um, uh, eight minute or so interview time period to the next station with about a minute in between, um, and again, two minutes or so um, to review the next scenario. The types of MMI stations that you might actually encounter um, are here. Um, most are going to be a discussion-based scenario whereby um, a particular domain, um, either ethical, an ethical dilemma, um, something that assesses your self-awareness or your communication skills uh, will be posed. And then there are acting scenarios. Some institutions use um, paid actors who are there to engage you in a, um, a setup scenario and a rater who's evaluating your response um, in that acting scenario. There's a collaboration station, which um, we call the, the teamwork. And as Dr. Maida um, mentioned earlier, we all are um, in healthcare leaning towards um, a team-based approach. And so it's vitally important whether you're going to be in laboratory research or in the clinical environment um, that um, collaboration and teamwork are assessed well. So um, we pretty much always here at Stanford include a collaboration station where two applicants are in a room with one to two raters and the applicants work on solving a problem together during the MMI session. Um, there are some institutions that use an essay. We actually don't use an essay uh, where uh, you're responding to a prompt in writing. And then the all-important rest station, <laughs> sometimes these MMI days can go quite long and having a few minutes of rest in between may be helpful to um, uh, rejuvenate yourself. And so if we look at a few uh, sample scenarios, um, these are the types of things that you might encounter. So uh, a collaboration um, scenario um, of an origami. Two applicants uh, will collaborate to create a paper folding or origami project. One applicant who has a depiction of the final product will verbally guide the other who has a blank sheet of paper into the completion of the origami project. The applicants will sit with their backs toward each other. And after a few minutes, about five minutes, which is an eight minute scenario, then they will be allowed the final three minutes to discuss the product. And so the assessors who are there, or the raters, will be there to observe their teamwork and the communication between the two. And then a more standard type of discussion-based scenario might look something like this. Liberation therapy, a vascular operation developed um, to potentially cure multiple sclerosis is certain, in certain patients has recently come under some serious criticism, delaying its widespread use. Among other experimental flaws, critics cite a small sample size in the original evidence used to support LT. As a health policy maker, your job is to weigh the pros and cons in approving novel drugs and therapies. Please discuss the issues you would consider during an approval process for LT. Now, as you're thinking about this, um, one of the um, uh, aspects of, of MMI are this. We do not um, require that you come in with some a priori knowledge of, let's say, liberation therapy. I think as you're pr approaching MMI, it's important um, that you're uh, relying on general basic um, principles not necessarily getting nervous because, hey, I don't know anything about this particular therapy. Um, the success of MMI really relies on your being able to deconstruct the basics of um, your general thought processes in handling a brand new problem. And so that's what the sample scenarios um, will do. How well do you communicate with someone else, not only in terms of 
uh, giving instructions, but also receiving instructions and gathering from that other individual information that is important for you to be able to um, uh, to be able to um, complete the task. Um, because uh, at least with the club collaboration scenario, for example, one might say, well, hey, I performed pretty terribly because the person who was giving me instructions was not that good. Um, remember, there are two, um, usually two raters. One is really evaluating you if you're the receiver um, uh, to evaluate how well you are able to gather some of the information that you feel you might actually need. So that's why um, that works both ways. So um, with that, um, I will ask if there's any questions, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibbs. Another uh, great set of information for our applicants to consider. Lots of questions to get through, so I have chosen ones that we've seen for lots and lots of questions about, so these are really themes. Um, and any of our presenters, feel free to hop in and comment up on these as you'd like. So the first one is sort of along the lines of, well, I have a bad grade or some kind of kink, if you will, in my application. So what are your tips for explaining that during the interview? Should I bring it up proactively or only comment if asked? This is um, Iris Gibbs. Um, I would say that you should only bring it up really if it's asked. Um, the interview setting is usually quite um, um, short overall. Um, and so um, proactively bringing up the question, um, you know, may, uh, you know, that, that there may be a circumstance where that may be appropriate, but in most instances, um, the uh, you were invited for an interview with that knowledge. And if there, were, there was more clarification required for that, um, you would probably be um, be asked about it. But once asked about the question, uh, I think it's important um, to show your resiliency, um, to show um, a certain level of accountability, and how you've grown from that particular experience. Um, those are the important features that I think, um, uh, you know, deans like myself want to see. We don't necessarily need to um, hear sob stories about um, certain, um, it may be important to provide some context, but if what, if it means that you don't ultimately take accountability for that, then that um, then those types of responses that don't take accountability actually are not helping you. Yes, this is Ed Daniel, USF. Um, I agree uh, with Dr. Gibbs. Um, we have a question on our secondary application that asks if you've received a grade lower than a B minus to explain. And so if we are inviting you for an interview, that means we've read your explanation and we're comfortable with that situation. If it comes up, just be honest, um, um, demonstrate a level of, of intelligence and maturity and the fact that you own up to the grade and what happened. Um, but um, I wouldn't be nervous about it. I wouldn't be you know, forthcoming with anything. Just um, if it comes up, answer the question honestly and um, be confident and believe in yourself. Okay, another um, big one that was asked around this theme. So what what do interviewees typically bring with them? Should we bring a copy of our application, our resume, our CV? Is it okay to bring a notebook or a notepad to take notes during presentations and interviews? Good, um, this is Ed Daniel, Sorry, South Florida. I, I would say you could bring a notepad to take some notes and jot down a couple of thoughts. I would not walk in with um, questions already written down for you to ask regardless of how the interview went. That kind of seemed a little bit weird. Um, but yes, you can have a pad with a pen and just jot down some notes uh, during the interview, you know, so that when the interview is over, you can a ask some questions. Just be comfortable. So I'm going to respectfully disagree with Ed. I'm okay with you bringing in um, questions that you came up with already. Uh, they may not have been answered in the course of your day, and they may be questions you have about the curriculum, or they may have been generated earlier based on something else that you heard. So I'm actually okay with that. I agree, you can bring a notebook with you. I would not, you do not need to bring a copy of your application. You do not need to bring a CV with you. We have all of that information. Um, for our school, if you have any updates, if you have any publications that have happened or anything that's happened since you've submitted your application, that's a time where you can bring it with you. 
Um, this is Iris Gibbs. I think um, I, I may agree um, on both ways, um, but I think uh, there's a delicate balance in terms of the um, asking of questions um, to, to make sure that the even though the interview is a two-way street, um, to not um, leave the impression that it's such an in, in, um, um, uh, inquisition that um, you know that you are just drilling the school to see. Um, whether or not they're good enough for you, um, I, I don't care which school it is. Um, you should you should not um, leave that institution sort of um, or the interview or sort of feeling that you are coming in with so many um, questions um, that um, that question whether or not you are um, whether or not the school itself is sort of um, suitable for you. So be careful about how you ask those questions. Thank you all. Um, what are some of the questions or topics that applicants struggle most with or seem to be most unprepared for? <laughs> I, if I can start on this one, it would be for me the most basic question, which is why do you want to be a physician? I laugh so many times when we ask that question and I just see so many people stumble on that and I, my assumption would be that would be the, the easiest question or the one applicants would re, would rehearse the first. So um, just be prepared to answer the question, you know, why do you want to be a physician? Why does it matter to you? And um, um, that would be my response to that question. This is Lena Mehta from Case Western. I don't, I don't typically see a trend. The reality is most candidates that show up for interviews are so well rehearsed that they've been practicing and prepping that I don't see a general one that spans all candidates. I do think that students frequently will have difficult as Dr. Gibbs, difficulty, as Dr. Gibbs mentioned, discussing deficiencies in their application because they're worried that they're not going to look perfect. And we don't need perfect. We need somebody who's resilient and who's learned from their errors. and somebody who maybe had a dip in their application and they've redeemed themselves may actually be stronger because they've learned how to recover from something like that. So applicants do get very uncomfortable talking about any potential deficiencies in their record, but you really don't need to be, as Dr. Gibbs indicated, by the time we, we're all aware of this and that you've been invited for the interview anyway, so just own up to it and take responsibility. I think one of the common, um, you know, errors here um, when you find yourself having been asked a question that maybe um, you're not exactly readily uh, prepared, um, prepared to answer, is really taking those few seconds to, you know, um, relax a little bit and um, give a, a reasonably thoughtful response, even if you weren't exactly prepared for, um, for the question. I think it is not a good idea um, to just continue rambling, um, you know, just random thoughts hoping that something sticks and um, you just sound um, illogical and um, disorganized. You want to, in the brief time that you have, um, to be able to somehow organize some set of, of, of responses. Again, whether it be the MMI or whether it be uh, for a traditional interview, that skill is going to be observed um, and uh, you'll do much better if you take a few seconds at least to think about your responses before speaking. Great. Uh, one quick question, just a general question that I can answer actually is, how do you find out about which type of interview the school has? One, you can look at the school's website, and two, the AAMC has a resource called the Medical School Admissions Requirements, MSAR, is the acronym for that one, MSAR, and it has information um, about all of the medical schools, including what type of interview they offer. Um, we are running up against time, so I'm going to ask a couple more questions if you don't mind sticking around for a minute or two. Um, are interviewers suspicious of applicants who have decided to pursue the practice of medicine after working in a, in a very different field, like law or education? I will, I will take um, that, a stab of this question first. Um, those of us who are looking for diversity in their class are looking for what I call transferable skills. And sometimes having that additional career or having those additional experiences 
um, only enhance um, that person's ability to sort of um, transfer certain skill sets into medicine. And so I would say that, that uh, most of us, particularly again, that you've gotten to the interview, um, we're not, not necessarily suspicious of that. This is Lena Mayda. I agree with Dr. Gibbs. Um, we do, though, look to see that there's a story, that you're not leaving your prior career because you hated it and you just need to find something else to do, but instead that you've taken the time to explore medicine and to realize that that is a better path for you. But the transferable skills are great. We have tons and tons of non-traditional students at our school at case, so we really do actually embrace that very much. But again, we just want to make sure and see that there's some logical pro progression there. Uh, South Florida, I agree with both my peers. All right, what are some examples of appropriate questions to ask my interviewers? This is Lena Mehta from Case Western. I, I'm okay with questions. If you have a question, ask. There's, you know, questions that are you're just asking for the sake of asking are not going to be helpful. But if there's some a question that was generated in your mind based on something about the curriculum, as I said, or a question about the research thesis that we have, or student experience, or I'm okay with questions. As, as long as they're real and genuine and you really want to know the answer, I'm okay with that. I don't know that there's a wrong one in my mind. Um, this is Ed Daniel, South Florida. I would always, um, uh, as an interviewer, appreciate questions that, that leads me to believe that you've done your research and that you're trying to really connect with the university. Um, we're building a new medical school that's going to be built in, um, in the next two to three years. So a question would be, uh, are you excited about the new medical school that's being built? Or the select program, you know, I'm really excited about that. How did that come about? Anything that leads me to believe you really want to learn just a little bit more about the school because you're so intrigued by the day and, and the interview that leaves me with, you know, leaves me feeling like, wow, this student after the interview day is very interested in us and uh, is really excited. So. Um, those are just two examples of questions that, that um, if I heard, I would be impressed by. And I agree. Okay. What's the best way to incorporate pieces of my personal statement, secondary essays, and, uh, sorry, and my secondary essays into my interview answers? Should I talk about them as if the interviewer has no previous knowledge of my activities or that they have at least a baseline knowledge. This was a, a big theme here. So, um, and also in that same realm, how do I find out if my interviewers have access to my file before I meet them? So hopefully ahead of time you, um, you know, can find out um, through the office whether or not the interviews would be, will be blind or, or open. Um, and if they are an open interview, uh, yes, the, the interviewee, interviewer um, would have probably seen your file, but to remember every single detail that's included in your file is probably not, um, you know, not feasible. So it is actually okay to highlight, don't retell, but to highlight some of the major accomplishments that you want or um, themes that you want the school to be left with when they think about you. I always ask um, this question is if, you know, by the time that you leave here and we've now done the full circuit, what do you want me to remember about you? And so if you can think about that ahead of time um, without retelling all of the details and the con context, um, you might be able to highlight the most important aspects of your um, written application just for a brief kind of reiteration, um, you know, during the interview, but not to take all the time in doing so. Okay, I'm going to ask two more questions since we're running a little over. How do you deal with difficult ethical questions like euthanasia? dealing with terminally ill patients, and changing healthcare infrastructure. Are there right answers that you and the interviewers are looking for? I'll take a, yeah. Go ahead, Iris. 
I'll, I'll just take a brief stab at that because it, those are, are, are probably a range of topics that may very well be asked during the setting of an MMI interview. Um, and so um, the take home message there is there is no right answer. However, um, whatever is truthful for you um, and genuine from, for, from your standpoint, um, you know, could be um, discussed. Um, what is probably more important is that you're able to deconstruct a particular um, uh, dilemma or issue and present it from um, all sides. And so that's probably more important than, um, than necessarily um, providing what you may think, um, think is a, is a um, correct answer. This is Lena Mehta. I agree with Iris, and I'll also build on that by saying we ask some of those questions not because we want to know the answer, but because we know that you're in tune with some of the hot topics in medicine. A lot of the questions um, that were, a lot of the areas that were referenced in that question are ones that are going to impact your career as a physician. And if you don't know that healthcare reform is ongoing or that there are discussions of physician assisted suicide or any of those areas, you may not have informed yourself well about the practice of medicine because without a doubt your future career is going to be impacted by many of those. Yeah, and I would just add, it, it's okay to say, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a tough question. Um, there are many different perspectives to look at that scenario, and um, I really don't know. Uh, and, that, and it kind of demonstrates um, a little bit of the emotional intelligence that you see the problem from multiple perspectives, and um, I don't want um, applicants to feel that a question like that, you have to commit to one side or the other. So just be comfortable with saying, I don't know, it's an interesting question, tough question, um, elaborate a little bit, but be comfortable saying, I, I, I'm, I don't know. And I think some interviewers might appreciate that. And to wrap up with one more question, so again, a theme here, what is the acceptable practice um, if you have coincidentally um, been put into a situation where you have a conflict of timing for two different interviews at different schools, um, or if uh, you have been offered two interviews in the same geographic area, which you'll need to travel to, is it okay to um, contact the admission office of those schools and ask for dates that are close to each other so you can make one trip? What's the accept acceptable protocol in those types of situations? This is Lena Mehta. Absolutely, in our office, you can always call us and let us know that you've got a situation such as that. We can't always guarantee we're going to accommodate it, but we know how expensive and stressful and long the interview season is. So we will work with you to try and make things as easy as possible. And I agree 100%. We understand um, if we're inviting you for an interview, that means we, we believe very highly in you and think you're a very strong candidate, and we're assuming all the other medical schools are thinking the same thing. So we're, we know you're going to have other offers uh, to be interviewed, and we understand the dilemma and the financial implications. So uh, that would not be perceived as negatively if you contacted us. Instead, you have two other interviews in the state very close by. We just want to try to merge the dates a little bit easier, and we'll be as best we can accommodating. I agree, and just being nice to the staff. <laughs> <laughs> So some very consistent messages tonight for all of you potential um, physicians that have joined us tonight. Um, again, thank you so much for your time and many kudos to our wonderful panelists tonight. Um, thank you so much for your insight and tips to do well in this process. Um, again, we will post uh, this, uh, the recording of this session onto the AAMC. Sorry, I moved the slide too fast onto the AAMC uh, Student Hub, so we'll send you a quick link. Um, uh, if you would, if you enjoyed this presentation or didn't enjoy it, please fill out the survey that's going to automatically pop up on your screen. And also join us on our AAMC pre-med community. We're on Facebook and Twitter, as you can see here. Uh, we share lots of information um, and resources for you there as well. So thank you again for your time. and. Um, do look out for more webinars in the series. Thank you all, and thanks, panelists. Have a Thank great you, Mandy. Thank, Thank you. Good luck to all of you students.